Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Matt Fury, and on behalf of everyone at Avid, we want to welcome to the main stage, Mr. Kevin Smith. Now, I, um, I was enthralled by the Avid trailer. It's hypnotizing, isn't it? Well, it's basically, it's just like the terrorists are coming to kill our children, and only Avid can stop them, you know? It plays like a movie. That was kind of ballsy. We'll I be a little it. more subtle about it next time. <laughs> yeah, it is really the over-top sell. I also want to point out, too, that this poster in the middle, that was made by some fan online. It's a beautiful poster, but we didn't, we didn't make it. I just think it's cool that it's up here, because whoever made it might see this picture and be like, oh, my God, I was a part of the exposition. That's kind of neat. <laughs> That's how you work social media. Now, before we get started, there's a couple things we need to hit, take care of. Okay. First and foremost, uh, you know, these show shirts are great, but you can't have Kevin Smith on the booth and sit down dressed like this, so I gotta take care of something. You know. <laughs> yes. Much Original six, okay. well done. Now we can talk. Uh, fresh off a 16-city tour of the yes. new film Red State, wildly successful. About 1,000 people in each theater, is that correct? Over. I think we were averaging about 1,200 people a night. All right, before we start getting into the details of Red State, why don't we give everyone a taste of uh, what this film's all about. Okay. If you... Um, are we going to show a clip? We are going to show your clip. First time right now? Like, we're, yeah. we're going into it? Okay, big spoiler clip. If you guys aren't into spoilers, you don't want the movie spoiled for, spoiled for you, this is, like, deep into the flick. Uh, uh, if you're shooting it and putting it online, know that you're a fucking bastard who's spoiling it for everybody. <laughs> that being said, uh, our picture, Red State, is this, uh, this little horror movie we keep calling it. Uh, it keeps changing uh, as you watch the flicks. About three different movies mashed up into one. This takes place, the clip we're about to watch, is kind of in the third act or the third movie within the movie. At this point in the flick, uh, there's a kind of Waco-like standoff between the ATF and our villains, the Cooper family. Um, so that's kind of what's going to lead into this section. We were trying to figure out what to show. And what are we doing? Just showing the clip, breaking it down? Are we doing something educational or just like, look at this, this is fucked up? I, I would go with the third one, yeah. Third one, okay. okay. So it was just, we're going to watch it for the fun of it and shit. Later on we'll discuss it. But it's pretty, it's pretty exciting and active. There's a lot of uh, gunplay and shit, so watch your ears. But like I said, spoilers galore. Some shit going to happen that if you haven't seen the movie, they'll be like, fucking up, why'd you tell me that? But it's a badass clip. You All right, man. To watch? Here we go. Let's give it a shot. What I like about it is it doesn't look like a Kevin Smith movie at all. Number one. Number two, that's my wife. Yeah, how did that, um, how'd that conversation go? She, well, she wanted to be in the flick, and she'll be the first to tell you she's no actress and shit, and I, I agree. Um, <laughs> but uh, I thought she quitted herself well, but every flick we make, she's always like, can I be in it? And I'm like, no, man, like, we're all professionals and shit. She's like, you put all your friends in the, in the fucking movies you make. She's got a point. Yeah, she's like, why don't you put your best friend in the movie? And I was like, I did. Jason Mewes is in all the movies. <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I couldn't fight it. And I said, like, okay, I'll put you in the flick, but you got to shoot a gun in the sequence. We're going to put you in the Cooper family, so you got to be ready for the, for the gunfight in the third act. And she's not a gun person by any stretch of the imagination. She wouldn't say she's a gun... I wouldn't say she's anti-gun, but she's very gun control. Um, and she, uh, like, she made us go to the Million Mom March like uh, when Harley was one years old because she was very much about, like, you got to keep this shit locked and away from kids or blah, blah, blah. So I told her, I was like, you're going to have to shoot a gun in the movie. And she's like, I don't want to do that. I was like, you have to. And she's like, well, can't I just pretend, hold it, and just be like, bah, 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 bah. And I was like, no. Like, maybe in Mallrats, not in this movie. So um, 
she uh, came to kind of to the set the day that she was shooting the stuff on the rooftop. It was called uh, Top of the Crown sequence is what we call it. And um, the day of the shoot, she was like, I was like, I'm going to send you off with Scotty Props, who's in charge of the armaments and stuff. He's going to teach you how to fire an automatic weapon. I was still shooting something else. I said, we'll meet back here at the bus after about half an hour. You go do that. I'll do the, the shooting. We'll come back, eat lunch, and, and talk about the, the next sequence, which is her on the rooftop firing the gun. So I came back after I was done, waiting to eat lunch with her, and she didn't show up. She wasn't there. And then a half an hour went by. She still wasn't there. And then an hour went by, and she finally showed up. And I was like, what's going on? And she was like, I shot guns. I was like, do you like it? She was like, too much. I was like, really? Why? She's like, it's like a vibrator with bullets. <laughs> yeah, she looked frighteningly comfortable in all those scenes. She was, man. She went for it. I was kind of impressed. She was like, she's a member of the uh, church family, the religious extremists, the Coopers. So uh, there's a big sequence that takes place in their subterranean chapel. And while it's going on, there's a dude who's about to be sacrificed and stuff. She's sitting in the crowd, and uh, her husband, uh, the character that James Parks plays, he gets up and goes off camera to kind of deal with the guy that got uh, imprisoned up front. So we're on a single on her, and I was like, look, I need some cutaways, man. Just pray. Like, give me some praying and shit. Do some churchy shit, because she don't know anything about church. She's real atheist and shit. So I was like, do me a favor, man. Just look like everybody else. Give me some praying. And she was like, okay, how do I do that? And I was like, just pray. You've seen people pray. And she was like, uh, okay. So I sit down and go to watch it. And I swear to God, my wife, who doesn't know from God or any of that religious nonsense, I'm Christian, right? And so for me, like, I'll, I'll, we take off at a plane. I hold her hand, say a prayer, just in case, cover our asses and shit. And invariably, when I do it, I hold her hand. This is my eyes are closed. And I don't go creepy like, oh, so, 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 like muttering out loud. I just say it quietly, close my eyes, hold her hand. Invariably, dude, I always hear this coming from my left. Ugh. So she don't like any of that shit, right? So I'm like, you got to pray in this scene. Look churchy. She's like, okay. She goes like this. <laughs> like a fucking samurai, man. It was too funny. So tell me the picture of you and I holding hands isn't going to be on the cover of NAB Daily tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so now that, uh, you know, she gets, she gets comfortable in the scene, what's it like directing your wife? It's, it's pretty easy. I mean, I... I that one's a little more difficult because generally you go up to any actor and be like, hey, try this. They're like, okay. And you go up to someone you're in a relationship with, you're like, try this. They're like, why? You know, and you're like, just because. And they're like, well, you didn't put the milk away last night. And you're like, just fucking act, would you? <laughs> so there's that. It, but it's much easier to, on this movie, I barely directed at all, I'll be honest with you. Like, this was the movie where I kind of fully lived in, into my role as editor. I've never really felt like a director uh, for most of the movies, I felt like a writer who got to direct his shit. But the last few years of the career, I've really felt like an uh, editor first and foremost. Because I don't, I don't direct traditionally the way most cats do. I used to kind of like stick my hand up people's asses and make them say what I wanted. And now I've kind of, I'm way more Clint Eastwood about it, where I'm just like, go ahead, man. Like I, somebody, a few cats I know work with Clint Eastwood, and I was like, what's that like? And they were just like, he just kind of sits there. He barely says action. He's just looking at his monitor, and you're acting. And then suddenly he'll be like, okay, and that's it. And like, he won't always be like, we're going for a second take, third take. He just might roll on. He gets what he wants and he moves on. So I was like, that's kind of the move. And on this movie, I didn't like you got, we have John Goodman in the movie. We have Michael Parks, who's fucking astounding. Melissa Leo just won an Oscar. You can't direct these fucking people. What am I gonna say? I'm like, I'm walking up to him. I'm like, hey man, do it like this. If I'm fucking Melissa Leo, I'm like, aren't you Silent Bob? <laughs> Go back to the monitor, you know? So for me, I just tend to stay out of the way. My directing on this movie is like they'd do a take and I'd go out and be like that was fucking awesome and then walk away you know we were kind of done but what I did I edited the whole fucking movie I was I've talked about it many times this flick I was I, since 2001 on Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back we started cutting while we were in production because I cut my own stuff but first time I used an Avid was on uh, Chasing Amy in 96 we had nine days that we rented it in an uh, editing suite in New York nine days to cut the flick. Mosier, Scott Mosier, my producer, had learned how to use the Avid. I hadn't, I was still a six-plate guy. I watched him for about 20 minutes, it was frustrating. Sitting behind somebody who's cutting is like sitting behind somebody who's playing video games. Because you just want to be like, hey man, just go over, go here, give me this real quick. <laughs> okay, and then you give it back. And I did that for about two hours. And like, I kept watching him and I didn't know how to do it, but I was like, hey man, just move that 
thing, if you go over here, give me the mouse, and then you do it, and you're like, okay, is that right? And he's like, yeah. And then after about two hours, I was like, move over, and I just sat in that chair and never moved, because I loved it. Like, it honestly, Avid made me, I'm not just saying because we're here at the booth, it's the only reason I'm here at the booth. Avid made me a better filmmaker. Everyone knows I entered this business, it, like, basically knowing nothing. You look at clerks, you're like, well, it's cute, but you don't know jack shit. And so I had to kind of go to film school in front of everybody during my entire career. But this was the real teacher. Once I got into digital editing, it was always avid for me from the start. That made me a better filmmaker because I was willing to try shit. Like back when we were cutting clerks, we were cutting on a six, uh, six plate steam bag. And we had all this fucking footage. We had garbage bags full of work print to go through. And that movie is a series of long takes just kind of taped together. It's no real editing there, but still, You'd have all this footage, you have a version of the movie together that you like, but let's say you screened it and like some element didn't work. And you're like, well, we have another shot, let's go back and look at it. And you'd look at that fucking like three garbage bags full of all that work print and you were like, you know what, it's fine, we're fine. <laughs> but with this, it's like, you're like, let's try it. You're like, okay, and you could try it. And if it doesn't, it's easy to find shit. If it doesn't work, you just quickly fucking undo it. So I fell in love with it instantly. So from 96 forward, I was at it in the flicks, but generally we would cut in post, so I'd shoot the whole time, and then once we were done, go home and start cutting. Dogma, I didn't touch any of the f footage, excuse me, until we got back uh, home, when we were all done with the, with the shooting, and so it took me like two, three months to put it together to cut it, but it didn't start till then, which is ridiculous, because if you're missing something, then you gotta like ramp up again and go back. The next movie we did, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, we were cutting while we were shooting, because we were doing the blunt saber sequence, and a lot of different shots. I mean, you look at the movies, not a lot of different shots, but for Kevin Smith, it was very taxing. So we had a bunch of different visuals and we wanted to keep track of them and we'd had storyboard elements and sorts. So I told, I told Mojo, I said, take the video tap footage, like it was on high eights. I said, take this, dump it in the Avid, then cut together like a skeletal version of what the scene could kind of look like. And Moj jumped it in the Avid and it took him like half an hour. And then he put actually a score track under it and brought it back, and that changed everything for me. I'm like, this is what the movie will look like. Everybody, this is what the movie will look like. And they're like, what an idiot. But to me, I was like, suddenly I'm seeing it. It went from being a theoretical to a concrete. It went from being something inside my head that you would try to explain to people to something you could literally show them. And from that moment forward, I was like, we should cut constantly while we're in production because number one, I could show people what I'm thinking rather than like six months later, like here's the finished movie. Um, number two, we could find things that if we missed, maybe we could grab. Like uh, we were, sh the blunt cave sequence with the blunt saber uh, fight, when it was all cut together, we were missing one reaction shot. And that's something like if we'd waited till the end of the show, like if I'd worked, if you hire an editor, if you work with an editor, sometimes they cut during the show, but I'm so anal retentive, I gotta cut all the footage myself that I separated the two, but I started combining them so that I was cutting while we were fucking shooting and improving as we went. That changed everything from Jane Silent and Bob Strike Fact forward. All I did was cut while we were shooting and I became more of a editor in my mind than a director because I just sit on set and watch a take and just be like, okay, I got that line. I got that line. Oh shit, we gotta get that line again. Ooh, that line's way better than I imagined. You collect it in your head and you've got your kind of a, a mental EDL that's sitting right here. and when the footage gets dumped in when I go home, because the workflow from we shot on Reds and, and the Canon 5D, dump those cards right into the fucking Avid. I'm cutting that night. So the next morning, I could come in with a laptop, set it up on the, on the, the um, monitor station, plug it into a squawk box, and collect the cast and crew and sit there and watch the scene. And I'm, I don't, you know, like fucking assemble. I, I fine cut the shit out of it. <laughs> So that by the time it's time to show people, it looks like the movie. I don't want it to be like, this is a general idea, like this is what I was thinking. So 